Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning for a special lecture jointly sponsored by Cardiology and Global Health. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Victor Davila Roman, Professor of Cardiology, Anesthesiology, and Radiology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. At WashU, Dr. Davila Roman is founding medical director of the Cardiovascular Imaging and Clinical Research Core Lab and associate director of uh, the Global Health Center. Uh, Dr. Davila Roman has had a truly impressive career. He's a renowned researcher in cardiovascular imaging, and for the last decade, he's uh, largely focused on healthcare in minority populations and on global health. He's received numerous NIH awards over the past 20 years. He's currently PI on 10 NIH and Foundation Awards, and these include an NHLBI Heart Failure Network Award, a Gates Foundation Trial on Household Air Pollution, several NIH awards on cardiovascular disease research in Rwanda and in Peru, and now uh, in most recently in Zambia. And uh, he has an NHLBI U24 Coordinating Center Award for people living with HIV. Dr. Rabil, uh, Davila Roman has been prolific with close to 200 publications. And particularly notable uh, is Victor's strong commitment to mentorship. He's PI of an NHLBI Pride training program for underrepresented minorities, which is currently in its 14th year. He's also PI of a K-12 mentor, mentor training program in implementation sciences. Victor will be speaking to us today about his vision for UW's Global Cardiovascular Disease Program in a talk entitled, Developing a Transformative Global Cardiovascular Health Program. Now, before we start, I'd like to remind the audience that given the Zoom format, uh, we'll do questions and answers at the end of Victor's talk. And while Victor's speaking, please write your questions in the question and answer box uh, at the bottom of the Zoom. Uh, for me to collate. And also, please note that other than Victor, everyone else uh, will be muted. Um, again, welcome, Victor. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Nona, for that generous introduction, and good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure for me to be here today presenting at the University of Washington Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. My talk as Nona said, is developing a transformative global cardiovascular health program. In the past several months, I have had the opportunity and pleasure of talking with many of you by Zoom. The University of Washington is, is establishing a new program in global cardiovascular health, a visionary joint effort between the Department of Global Health and the Division of Cardiology in the Department of Medicine and the reason for my talk today. Before I move on, I have to say, sadly, that I have no disclosures. My presentation today will provide an overview of four major topics related to global cardiovascular health and include the global burden of cardiovascular disease, a discussion of our team's cardiovascular disease research program, I will provide an overview on training and capacity building in cardiovascular health, and I will end with some thoughts on developing a transformative global cardiovascular health program. Cardiovascular disease, as all of you know, is a leading cause of death, not only in high-income countries like the US, but also globally, and in particular in low- and middle-income countries. In 2017, in the U.S., over 800,000 people died of cardiovascular disease, with coronary heart disease being the lead cause, followed by stroke, high blood pressure, and heart failure, and others. Cardiovascular disease claims more lives each year than cancer and chronic lung disease combined. Cardiovascular disease mortality has gone down over the last 30 years. 
Some recent studies suggest a plateau or even an increase in cardiovascular related mortality. For example, related to hypertension, which seems to be increasing more in our rural compared to our urban populations in the US. This is clearly a disturbing trend. Cardiovascular disease has been the leading cause of death, not only globally, but also in low and middle income countries and accounted for 17.8 million deaths in 2017, a number that is expected to grow to greater than 22 million by 2030. Globally, four out of five cardiovascular disease deaths are due to heart attacks and strokes, mostly occurring prematurely. For example, in low and middle income countries, the clinical manifestations of cardiovascular disease occur at a much younger age compared to those in high income countries. As many of those suffering from cardiovascular disease are young people in their prime years of productivity, they now become a burden not only to their families, but society in general. The economic impact of cardiovascular disease and in particular, the early development of cardiovascular disease in terms of healthcare expenditures, lost productivity, and resource diversion are devastating high income and low and middle income countries. In the US, cardiovascular disease related disorders resulted in direct health expenditures of 214 billion, with cardiovascular disease and stroke accounting for 14% of total health expenditures in 2014. Globally, cardiovascular disease related costs have also continued to increase steadily and are predicted to exceed $1,000 billion by 2030. According to the World Heart Federation, cardiovascular disease is not no longer just a health issue, but a major economic burden. Analysis of data from University of Washington's own Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation show that only a small fraction of the development assistance for health budget went for non-communicable diseases in low and middle income countries in 2015 representing 1.4% of the $536 billion in that year. Although more than 87% of global disease burden was in low and middle income countries, only 35% of global spending on health occurred in those countries. The global burden of cardiovascular disease is great and growing low and middle income countries are being disproportionately affected by cardiovascular disease. And those countries that need the most assistance are not getting it, representing a major gap in healthcare expenditures and research. I am now going to pivot into the second part of the presentation to give an overview of our global cardiovascular research program and we'll talk briefly about our two major areas of research, household air pollution and hypertension. In 2010, the three leading risk factors for global burden of disease were high blood pressure, tobacco smoking, and household air pollution from burning solid biomass fuels. This study found that household air pollution is responsible for 3.5 million premature deaths globally, including deaths from COPD, pneumonia, lung cancer, among others. Cooking with biomass fuels, such as wood, crop residues, dung, charcoal, and coal in open fires expose household members to harmful pollutants. Furthermore, in some of these homes, plastic and other more toxic substances are also routinely burned. 
This study by Bonjour from 2013 shows that worldwide, the proportion of households cooking mainly with solid fuels has decreased over the past 30 years. However, due to population growth, the actual number of persons exposed has remained stable at around 2.8 billion during the past three decades. Solid fuel use is most prevalent in Africa and Southeast Asia, which represents a major global health gap. Particulate matter 2.5 or PM 2.5 describes particles with diameters less than 2.5 micrometers, which are typically inhaled into the lungs resulting in lung damage and absorption into the circulation. These particles are typically made of hundreds of different chemicals such as sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and others. The typical household air pollution exposure significantly exceeds that of ambient air pollution. Our global health team at Washington University in collaboration with the team from John Hopkins University, led by my colleague, Will Checkley, has been doing research on the cardiopulmonary effects of household air pollution in the region of Puno, located in the southern part of Peru on the border with Bolivia. The photo on the left shows Puno and Lake Titicaca, the world's highest navigable body of water and the birthplace of the Inca civilization. The figure on the upper right shows a typical house with a single entrance and small windows, which result in very poor ventilation and a lot of indoor smoke generation during cooking, which typically happens twice a day. In this study published, by our Washu Hopkins team in the journal Heart in 2013. We performed ultrasound of the carotid artery in 262, 266 subjects and grouped them according to household air pollution exposure into rural dwellers who have high household air pollution exposure and urban dwellers who have low exposure due to cooking with um, LPG or electric stoves. The two groups were similar in age and gender. As shown on the table on the right, the household air exposed group had greater mean carotid intima media thickness, higher carotid plaque prevalence, higher systolic blood pressure, and higher median household PM 2.5 and carbon monoxide levels. All these variables remain statistically significant in multivariable regression models. This study is one of the first to show that chronic exposure to household air pollution was associated with markers of cardiovascular disease. The figure on the right shows a two millimeter atherosclerotic plaque in a 46 year old woman with long-term household air pollution exposure. The graphs on the right, on the left, show the spikes in, in household air pollution for both PM 2.5 and carbon monoxide during cooking twice a day in a rural dwelling compared to the flat curves in the urban dwellers at the bottom. In another study of 1,004 individuals, some with household air exposures and others without, we found an association between biomass fuel use with both prehypertension and hypertension. Biomass fuel users had both higher systolic and diastolic blood pressure when compared with non-users. This study showed that household air pollution is associated with high blood pressure and also with a higher likelihood of having hypertension. And thus, reducing exposure to household air pollution represents an opportunity for prevention of cardiovascular disease. 
Several lines of evidence suggest at least three mechanisms linking ambient air pollution and cardiovascular disease. First, autonomic dysregulation has been shown in multiple studies, including our own in Peru, suggesting increased blood pressure and decreased heart rate variability with acute and long-term exposure. Second, the translocation of inhaled particles into the systemic circulation causes an intense activation of inflammatory biomarkers, platelet activation, and hypercoagulability, all of which has been associated with cardiovascular disease. Finally, in elegant studies using inhaled gold nanoparticles in atherosclerotic mice and in humans undergoing carotid and arterectomy, have shown accumulation of these gold nanoparticles in the blood vessel wall, causing vascular inflammation and atherosclerosis, providing a more direct <clears throat> mechanism to explain the link between air pollution exposure and cardiovascular disease. Our group has leveraged several <clears throat> grant research opportunities. The Household Air Pollution Intervention Study, or HAPIN, is an international multi-center study aimed at assessing the impact of a liquefied petroleum gas cooking stove intervention on health. The project is funded by Gates Foundation and NHLBI at the tune of $30 million. The HAPIN study is a randomized controlled trial of 3,200 households in four low and middle income countries in Guatemala, in India, in Peru, and Rwanda, and with participation of US and international sites, including Emory, Hopkins, University of Colorado, UCSF, Washington University in St. Louis, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. After initial planning and formative research, the study recruited participants from May 2018 through February 2020, with follow-up data collection continuing through August 2021. In each country, eligible pregnant women were recruited and their households randomly assigned to an intervention versus control groups on a one-to-one -one ratio with follow-up for 18 months until their newborn child is one year old. Intervention households received a free LPA stove and free unlimited supply of LPG for the 18 month study period. Control group households do not receive an LPG stove or fuel during the study period, but receive this at the end of the 18 months. Primary health outcomes are birth weight, stunting at 12 months of age, and severe pneumonia in the first 12 months of life for the child, and blood pressure in the older adult woman living in the same household. Among secondary outcomes, carotid intima media sickness, and brachial artery reactivity testing and cardiovascular serum bio are obtained in the older adult woman to evaluate for cardiovascular disease. Personal household air exposure is measured through instrumentation placed on the participants. As shown on the picture, study participants wear the exposure devices on their clothing, allowing for personalized exposure assessment. In addition to participation on the study with the PUNO site, our Group at WashU has also been leading the clinical and imaging core of the HAPIN trial. During the formative phase of the trial, we trained sonographers from all sites on how to acquire fetal, lung, and vascular ultrasound images using the Sonocyte Edge portable ultrasound system. These ultrasound systems are loaded with software for DICOM imaging and PACS network interface, which allow <clears throat> secure upload to a cloud-based platform. 
either directly from the portable ultrasound system or from local computer, shortly after the images are obtained at the study participants' homes. After ultrasound the images are uploaded to the cloud, this icon immediately available at our WashU, Oxford, and Hopkins servers for image storage, evaluation, and blind interpretation by our core lab sonographers. This slide shows the large number of images handled for this study, comprising over two terabytes of data. Report forms are completed online and are linked to each ultrasound video, making this an extremely secure and efficient workflow with the ability to provide quick feedback to the sites in case of problem with image acquisition and also providing for a robust quality assurance program. I am now going to switch gears once again to talk about our global program in hypertension. As stated before, hypertension is the leading risk factor for global health and disability and responsible for 7% of the global burden of disease. It should be no surprise to this audience that hypertension represents a huge healthcare gap. In 2017, in the US, there were about 160 million people with hypertension. And globally, in 2010, there were 1.4 billion patients, most of them living in low and middle income countries. The transition <clears throat> from hypertension to two major intermediate phenotypes, left ventricular hypertrophy and left ventricular diastolic dysfunction occurs in about 25 to 50% of patients with hypertension. These intermediate phenotypes represent a major risk for development of the clinical syndrome of heart failure, resulting from either systolic and or diastolic dysfunction and affecting about 6.2 million Americans. The shifting global burden of hypertension will have devastating consequences in low and middle income countries, both in terms of morbidity and mortality. In 2025, the highest prevalence of hypertension is expected to occur in low and middle income countries where 75% of the world's hypertensives will live, representing a significant unmet healthcare gap. Recognizing that it takes an average of 17 years for new scientific discoveries and to enter the day-to-day -day clinical practice, and that only 14% of research reaches long-term quality healthcare, the NIH has placed implementation science as one of its strategic objectives to optimize clinical and implementation research to improve health and reduce disease. Implementation science is a study of methods to promote integration of research findings and evidence into healthcare policy and practice to improve healthcare of populations. The NI studies represent the last stage of research in the science to practice continuum, preceded by pilot studies, efficacy, and effectiveness studies that are distinct from and address different questions. Distinct phases exist within DNI, defined by adaptation, implementation, sustainability, and scalability. The NHLVI program late stage implementation research addressing <clears throat> hypertension in low and middle income countries, scaling up proven effective interventions, presented a research opportunity to conduct implementation science studies in hypertension in low and middle income countries. Our project titled <clears throat> Addressing Hypertension and Diabetes Through Community Engaged Systems in Puno, Peru, the Andes study. It's a hybrid three 
implementation science, so the aim that assessing the, <clears throat> the impact of a community health worker-led multi-component intervention to evaluate and treat hypertension in a low-income indigenous population setting in Puno, Peru. The multi-component intervention includes identifying hypertensive subjects through health fairs and then having community health workers lead an intervention composed of blood pressure self-monitoring, risk factor modification, blood pressure medication delivery, and follow-up versus usual care. Subjects are randomized by clusters to the intervention and followed up for 12 months, with the primary outcome being systolic blood pressure change, while also evaluation evaluating implementation outcomes of acceptability, appropriateness, and fidelity of the interventions. This five-year project is scheduled to start in August 2020. <clears throat> While COVID will make things a little bit more challenging, ongoing discussions are already underway to address protocol modifications, and we are confident that the, we will be able to complete this project. I will now shift <clears throat> gears again to part three of my talk to briefly discuss some of our work in training and capacity building in cardiovascular global health at both the U.S. and our partner low and middle income countries. First, at home, we're leveraging our mentor training in implementation science MTIS program to provide junior faculty training and mentoring in implementation science to conduct, conduct research projects in the areas of heart, lung, blood, and sleep disorders. And we have several trainees who are pursuing global health projects. The MTIS program provides two years of training with 70% protected time and allowance for coursework and research projects. In addition, our recently renewed T32 training program in cardiology has added a component for mentoring of cardiology fellows in global health. Through the Fogarty D43 training grant program and the NHLB IU24 Train High Track program, we have been mentoring training and building capacity in hypertension in both Rwanda and in Peru. The purpose of the train and high track programs is to support implementation strategies for evidence-based interventions for prevention, treatment, and control of hypertension in low and middle income countries. The WashU team has partnered with the Rwanda team, and I know that doctors Nona Sutudinia and Annette Fitzpatrick and others at the University of Washington have partnered with the Nepal team on the high, on the train high track consortium. Our D43 Fogarty grant and the U24 train program, both in Rwanda, have led to the training of well over 50 individuals in the areas of HIV, hypertension, dissemination, and implementation. And this training has led to many local mentored research projects by trainees. One of the major research gaps identified by the Rwandan team was the lack of robust training and availability of biostatistics tools. In response to this gap, we implemented the train the trainer model using the statistical software R, which is a programming language and free software environment for statistical computing and graphics used for data analysis. For this project, we brought two Rwandan trainees to WashU to attend our two-week summer course in August of 2018. After continuous planning between the two students and the local WashU team, a one-week course was held in Kigali in August 2019, taught 50-50 by the WashU and the Rwandan trainees, and with attendance of 25 Rwandan junior investigators. The program was 
incredibly successful. Plans are already ongoing to have the course in October 2020, likely through Zoom, but this time taught in its entirety by the Rwandan trainees with the WashU faculties serving as course evaluators to provide feedback. After that, the Rwandan team will continue their yearly course on their own, representing a sustainable training model. Part four of my presentation today focuses on my vision towards developing a transformative global cardiovascular health program. This vision includes four pillars and 15 strategic goals. Four pillars include partnerships, training, research, and sustainability. I expand on this in the next slides. To build deep institutional partnerships within the university and with key global health partners, I propose four strategic goals. Strategic goal number one, to identify key cardiology and global health department faculty interested in global cardiovascular health. This will become members of a new scientific advisory board that will work with the program director to develop all strategic goals and to help set priorities. Goal number two, define global cardiovascular health program goals and priorities. In coordination with the scientific advisory board, we will identify key strategic areas, investigators, and innovative ideas, which bring both experience and a vision to the program. Strategic goal number three, to increase multidisciplinary participation. Based on goals and priorities identified in strategic goal two, aggressively seek to expand involvement of a multidisciplinary group of investigators through the entire university. We propose to engage all schools and departments within the university to create new opportunities for collaboration, expanding to the fields of engineering, business, urban planning, data science, law, <clears throat> law and others who may have knowledge and skill set to make important contributions. This will provide new research and scholarship opportunities for students and faculty across the entire university. Strategic goal four, to build lasting relationships with key global health partners. Building sustainable long-term relationships with key international partners will be a high priority. And the program will also serve a critical role by establishing strong inter-institutional bonds connecting individuals and supporting interdisciplinary programs. To foster and sustain global health training opportunities at, at the university and globally. Strategic goal four will identify trainees and junior faculty interested in car global cardiovascular health. Development of a successful global health program will require recruitment and training of the next generation of global cardiovascular health researchers and represents a high priority. Trainees ideally would be identified early in their careers, for example, during medicine residency or cardiology fellowship or early while junior faculty. Formal training in global cardiovascular health can leverage opportunities within existing T32 training grants, additional K12 and KL2 grants through the MPH and PH programs and through the K23 NIH and other training and mentoring programs. Strategic goal six, to strengthen local training in global health cardiovascular disease implementation science and other relevant disciplines. These opportunities will give trainees a broad range of options for research and career development opportunities. And all local 
currently available resources should be leveraged to meet these goals and to develop new ones where training gaps exist. Strategic goal seven, to foster training, capacity building and scholarly exchange with our global health partners. In addition to training our own researchers, we must also help train our global health partners by directional exchange of scholars, facilitates the transfer of knowledge, creates opportunities for mutually beneficial collaborations and can provide the human capital needed to deliver essential services. An integral element of the program will be to promote exchange of faculty, students and trainees between our key global health partners. The central high priority element of the Global Cardiovascular Health Program is to identify and provide initial intramural funding research support for the most promising projects. Strategic goal eight is to support early innovative research addressing global cardiovascular health challenges. Limited access to early innovative research funding is a major barrier to developing new research in general and in particular in global health. The high priority element of the program will be to identify and provide initial intramural funding for the most promising research projects. Strategic goal number nine, to develop a strong multidisciplinary team able to respond to funding opportunities. Responding to global health calls for applications represents a cumbersome, high stress situation Increasing the chances of successful funding would benefit immensely from having a highly integrated and coordinated multidisciplinary research team where all the major team players fall in place early on in the process. An inbound response to calls for funding would have a high yield of research funding. Strategic goal number 10, communicate with funding organizations regarding global cardiovascular health needs. Funders such as NIH, GACD, Gates Foundation, and others need to hear directly from researchers where their research gaps are. University of Washington's own Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation is a great resource to promote this type of communications. In fostering strong fostering strong bonds with this world-renowned institutional resource should be a high priority. Fundraising and development will allow for the long-term sustainability of the program's strategic priorities. Strategic goal number 11 is to develop robust and effective communication platform core element of the program, a robust communication platform will be developed to keep key partners, potential funders and donors informed of programmatic activities and the impact of the work that they support. This in turn will facilitate recruitment of students and faculty and will increase national and international visibility, exposure and reputation. Strategic goal number 12, to build effective and sustainable resource streams. A significant amount of resources available through traditional funding sources, such as NIH and other organizational grants should be aggressively pursued. Strategic goal number 13, identify sources for fundraising and development. Forging ties with organizations interested in financially supporting global cardiovascular health work can be quite challenging. The program brings the necessary expertise to set up funding priorities and to direct funds to high impact projects that are consistent with the overall strategic goals of both the cardiology division and the Department of Global Health. And finally, strategic goal number 14, program evaluation. To evaluate the impact and success of the program, a number of metrics will be evaluated, including but not limited to faculty and trainees in the program, 
a number of multidisciplinary researchers participating in the program, external funding support, publications, and ability to secure program donors and research grants. The new program in global cardiovascular health represents an outstanding opportunity to be the leading program in the nation and indeed the world to the four pillars of partnership, training, research, and sustainability, we can make this happen. When my talk, I would like to thank, take this opportunity to thank our partner institutions, to thank our funding agencies, our trainees and research participants, to thank all of you at the University of Washington for taking time to meet with me in the past few months by Zoom. And I also hope to have the pleasure of meeting all of you in person very soon. Special thanks to Nona and Connie for making this process enjoyable all the way through. Thanks again for your attention. <laughs>